Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and present to you on this uh, extremely informative uh, webinar. Um, my name is Agnieszka Olszewska Guizo, and I am a landscape architect and a researcher uh, interested in the relationship between landscapes and mental health. And uh, today I am representing um, my uh, research foundation, Neurolandscape, and I will present to you um, the design guidelines for health promoting landscapes uh, with the focus on the contemplative landscape model. So I will start from what is basically a problem uh, of uh, that I'm trying to research and understand uh, why it is important to focus on mental health in the urban space design. Um, then I will talk about the potential of nature exposure in cities and how it can actually improve the situation. Also mentioning gaps in knowledge and some um, approaches to address these gaps in knowledge. Um, but most of all, during my presentation, I would like to focus on the contemplative landscape model and actual design guidelines and actual features of the urban space that can be um, applied in the design of more mentally healthy cities. Um, and I will discuss how they can actually contribute uh, to the mental health improvement uh, in the city populations. So uh, why, why do we even uh, look at the mental health from the lens of the urban design? So basically the problem of mental health is existing for a while. It's not anything recent and the, the statistics in it seem to de decline um, so seem to be more and more alarming each year, but uh, recently due to the COVID pandemic, the, um, the depression significantly jumped, uh, depression rates and prevalence um, around the world. This, are, this is the data from the WHO, uh, the newest report from 2022, which um, talks about even 28% jump in the major depressive disorders around the world uh, between only 2019 and 2020. So during one year, 28% of uh, increase in depression and 26% increase in uh, anxiety disorders. So these are just the uh, um, statistics from around the COVID pandemic, which was uh, a big challenge um, for mental health of uh, pretty much everyone around the world. But these numbers weren't good already before pandemic and it just got even worse. At the same time, um, we knew already, uh, according to the meta-analysis, so the studies that combine a lot of um, international research um, put them all together and analyze and make a consensus, scientific consensus out of it. So according to the meta-analysis from 2010, um, the urban populations uh, were much more at risk to developing uh, mental health disorders than the rural population. So this is telling us that there's something wrong about urban space urban environment that contributes to this uh, huge differences in the mental health prevalence between urban and rural populations. So um, why I'm saying huge? Because it is almost 40% more, 38% um, uh, higher risk of developing um, any disorder that they analyzed, all of the mental health disorders. Uh, 39, so almost 40% higher for mood disorders such as depression and 21% higher uh, for developing anxiety disorders. 
So this is quite a lot since 2010. Um, we can assume nothing really uh, improved, but only got uh, a little bit more challenge, not, not a little bit <laughs> more challenging due to uh, issues with uh, that we experienced during the pandemic, uncertainty and so on. Uh, so um, because of that, WHO in their newest report, in very interestingly for, for me, for people from my field, they started to actually recognize the uh, importance of the environment um, for the mental health promotion. These uh, charts are taken from their uh, most recent, published uh, only a few months ago, a report about global the status of global mental health. And they propose three paths to transformation. And for the first time, um, I've been following the reports for quite a while. So for the first time, only this year, they include reshaping environments is one of the three paths with um, natural environments reshaping and provision. They emphasize the provision and accessibility to urban green spaces as a path to improving mental health. And this really is for the first time. This issue wasn't, uh, was, was a little bit neglected before by WHO. But this time it is, it is there, and we can only um, we can only expect there will be much more emphasis globally about this, just because the research and the data is confirming that there really is something about our urban environments that contribute to mental health decline, and if if the decline can be assured by the environment, so can the environment uh, be transformed so that it improves the mental health. So we actually know there is already a consensus that a lot of um, benefits uh, in mental health and well-being comes from the exposure to nature in cities, especially in cities, because as I mentioned, the urban populations are most vulnerable when it comes to um, being affected by the uh, urban environment. Uh, so, so we already know from uh, science that it does work. We should uh, seek after solutions in the urban green spaces. Now, why? Why does that work? Why is the nature solution for us in the, in the urban populations? We actually also have a lot of information about that, and we have we are already very all very familiar with attention restoration theory, stress reduction theory, with biophilia hypothesis, and uh, there's also environment uh, enrichment model. Um, there are though a lot of gaps in knowledge that include what kind of nature we should be accessing in the cities and what kind of nature is uh, the target. So we as landscape architects, we know that uh, green spaces are not all the same. It's not enough to just put a shrub or a tree and then we can call it a green space, highly functioning and good for mental health and well-being. There is a myriad of uh, types of green spaces. There is uh, very different types of exposures to these green spaces. Uh, so this is this seems quite a big piece in the environmental psychology research um, that can that is causing actually inconsistent inconsistent findings uh, in the um, in the front of nature and health relationships. Here you can see um, the very uh, renowned and respected figure in uh, the field of landscape architecture, uh, the founder of first school of uh, arch landscape architecture in the world, Frederick Law Olmsted, and um, designer of famous parks such as uh, New York uh, Central Park. Uh, so Frederick Law Olmsted already in 18th century spoke about 
the power of natural scenery and that's only some certain aspects of nature and certain features of landscapes have the power as strong as medication can have. So um, echoing that notion, I started my studies on contemplative landscapes with the same belief that was already put up front in 18th century, but never actually confirmed with science. And I guess it was a little bit too early for Olmsted to, um, to be convincing to his peers. And he never got recognized from what he was saying about health and natural scenery. He was recognized for his designs. Um, so uh, basically what I uh, am doing is trying to research what kind of nature is the most beneficial for us, for who actually, for which groups, uh, what kinds of landscapes, what kinds of scenes and components of these scenes are recognized by our brains and provide us with the mental restoration and um, reduction of stress and any other benefits we can possibly take from such exposures. Um, there are also certain gaps in uh, knowledge connected with the studies, studies on the environmental psychology um, that usually um, they equate preference with salutogenesis. Uh, which is not exactly the same. When people liked certain type of landscape, the, the researchers were assuming that it is good for their mental health. So I think it is quite a far fetch to say um, that these the landscapes that people actually prefer from looking at them on the monitor or on the printed copy that these landscapes will be good for their health. We can like a lot of things that are not necessarily good for us. And here we have a cupcake to <laughs> represent that uh, situation. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. There may be indirect pathways that link the preference with uh, generating some good mental well, uh, health outcomes but it is not direct exposure and I as a researcher I would definitely dig deeper and we do have the tools that are better than just asking do you like this landscape. Um, to explain a little bit more I will quote Frederick Law Olmsted uh, about these flowers, like exposure to flowers. Um, so he said he used to speak about differences in perception of a common wild flower on mossy turf with a hybrid species of the same, uh, could, could be the same species imported from far, far away uh, that is beautifully blooming under the glass in an exposition hall. And the hybrid was rare and it would attract a lot of immediate attention and a lot of people loved it and owed uh, by it, by exposure to it. Um, but the former, while we have passed it by without stopping, while it has not interrupted our conversation or called for remark, may possibly, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted says, um, with other objects of the same class have touched us more and may have had a more soothing and refreshing sanitary influence. So. Uh, another gap in knowledge and um, something that comes up in research uh, a lot is that a lot of research is based on not exactly the human point of view um, and lots of research uh, that connect the uh, green spaces, quality and health are based on the satellite views and land cover maps. Um, they're based on the, um, the residency and postal address of a person. 
for example, um, they would investigate the radius of uh, the, the, the circle with the radius of like 100 meters, 200 meters from the postal address where you live in. Um, this has a little bit wrong assumptions that everyone living in the same and the same postal code in the same address, for example, in one huge uh, block of flats uh, will have similar patterns of exposure to their neighborhood um, circle, let's say, but it's not the case. Uh, another wrong assumption is that an administrative boundaries um, actually matter and are meaningful in the real life. And this we know it is not the case. Um, and, uh, and then uh, another wrong notion is that um, things can look different from the bird eye view and different from the ground. As you can see on this little picture, uh, the satellite view shows two exactly same um, courtyards, neighborhoods, and from the ground, they look very different. Right now, there is numerous uh, existing frameworks. And here I selected to this table, I selected only those all serve uh, to evaluate urban green spaces from the ground. And they all, almost all claim to improve the health and well-being. Some of them not so directly. That's why I put them into aesthetics scope. Um, however, uh, none of them, uh, interestingly, none of them was actually validated against health data. What it means is that um, the tools that were, like, it could be a questionnaire, it could be a, um, the, the framework uh, checklist uh, audit tool or questionnaire for the public or for the expert. Uh, so these tools, uh, they um, they did not ensure that what they are measuring is actually uh, influencing mental health outcomes. Um, so the validation was not about uh, health outcomes. So we do not know if a space scoring high with these tools will actually be good for health. They were validated uh, in a different ways more or less rigorous, but usually according to subjective self-reports. For example, um, with a question to the experts. So if it was the public-based questionnaire, it was evaluated with experts uh, being asked, does this, um, let's say, is this restorative <laughs> to you? <laughs> And uh, so if the expert says that it is, then it means it is. So it is good for restorativeness. Uh, okay, but they didn't recruit participants and observe their health outcomes. So, uh, so this is the advantage of contemplative landscape model. Um, it's one big advantage, I would say, uh, among others too. I mentioned them uh, in a while. Um, so the contemplative landscape model, what it actually is, is the seven items, seven categories tool um, where experts are scoring each of these items, each of these categories from one to six uh, points. And the six is the higher score, uh, highest score, and one is the lowest score. Um, it is specifically calibrated for urban green spaces. Um, it wouldn't work so well outside the city. Uh, it targets the specific outcomes that are also considered actually the most important for urban populations, uh, which is stress reduction, relaxation, positive emotions induction, as well as the mindfulness, so like presence of here and now, feeling the uh, feeling connected with uh, 
with the moment and and uh, what you are exposed to and the relaxation as well um, as I, I mentioned the high reliability and validity of this tool i will go through all of the points here today but now let's talk a little bit about the experiments with neuroscience and contemplative landscape models. So since uh, 2011, there's actually have been several uh, contemplative landscape model neuroscience experiments and studies, some of them, most of them con conducted by myself, um, but also uh, other research teams have undertaken some attempts uh, so I I studied uh, I, I uh, ran my experiments in Portugal and Singapore. Uh, in Portugal, it was part of my PhD uh, research. Uh, overall, um, what the studies found. Um, so speaking of kind of meta analysis of all the CLM studies uh, with neuroscience um, that there are the significant differences between the brain response to landscapes with high and low contemplative landscape score. Um, so that's a lot because uh, to see that the brain reacts differently, it's quite difficult to do and to have the significance level compared to medical um, to medical studies. It's, it's not that easy. It's a very conservative uh, field. Um, Further, landscapes uh, high in contemplative, uh, contemplativeness are causing the mood improvement, and this is a causal relationship, not just correlational, like a lot of studies, mm, which means we are controlling for all factors that could contribute or confound our findings. Um, for example, by comparing before and after the exposure. Uh, contemplative landscape scores were associated through these studies with alpha activity changes uh, and these are related to wakeful relaxation uh, so much needed in our urban living uh, they were also associated with theta activity fluctuations related to mindfulness so as i mentioned um, the presence of here and now, non-judgmental attitude, positive emotions to what you're perceiving at the moment, and relaxation, and the relaxed state of mind. And also, uh, they were associated with positive emotions in participants. So, the higher the score of the landscape, then it's likely that it will also induce, um, it will also be related to a self-reported positive emotion, such as um, yeah, pleasantness, liking the landscape, um, and also intensity of that emotion. Uh, one of the experiments was conducted in Singapore. It was actually the, the largest of uh, the experiments uh, on uh, contemplative landscape model and uh, neuroscience. It took place between 2018 and 2021. It compared actually the laboratory based lab controlled environment exposure to landscapes with the actual in situ outdoors exposure. Mm, we recruited healthy as well as clinical population uh, with depression, with clinically diagnosed depression, and we used two um, ne neuroscientific brain imaging tools, um, EEG and FNIRS. Mm, we were looking at the mood, the preference, the severity of depression, uh, stress and relaxation, and at the same time, especially with, uh, with regards to outdoors environment, we were looking at the environmental confounding factors, such as temperature, humidity, brightness, and so on. So what we found, uh, I will not go too much into details 
here you can see uh, some publications from these studies. Um, so what we found that the exposure to therapeutic garden that was uh, our highest contemplative landscape score exposure caused the mood improvement regardless of uh, uh, of the of the like humidity temperature at the site and regardless of just the inconvenience of taking part in in such experiment in um, in humid climate um, and other environments that we compared it to um, decreased the mood especially our controlled environment which is here on the top of the top picture um, in the busy environment in the, in the city uh, so yeah uh, mood improvement in the therapeutic garden then exposure to therapeutic garden caused uh, the most uh, positive emotions self-reported uh, then the brain activity related to cognitive strain was lowest in the therapeutic garden so it seemed like in this highly contemplative space um, the brain activity that is usually ten tends to be during cognitive tasks tends to be very fast and very highly processing is slowing down uh, causing relaxation and more um, less strenuous um, response mm, as compared with other green space that was residential green space it was uh, quite a generic um, type of landscape we can see in the neighborhood landscapes in Singapore and even more as compared with our control that was busy urban downtown we also observed the stronger effect in the vulnerable groups in the depressed patient so very interesting finding that sheds the light on the alternative ways or the of depression treatment or support for depression treatment because these patients um, they seem to benefit even more from the exposure to contemplative landscapes as compared to people who are uh, stable in their emotion and mood so there must be some kind of compensation mechanism that causes them to basically take more of the uh, nature exposure benefits than the healthy people and that's definitely worth further investigation um, we also we observe the specific pattern of the brain activity in the uh, depressed patients that is desirable in their treatment uh, yeah i will not go too much into detail you can read the paper uh, from the frontiers in psychiatry here um, and we also observed in that study, we observed the differences discovered, uh, the differences between the laboratory and the real exposure. So it seems that the, the studies that were only conducted in the lab, the studies with landscapes, with different nature exposures, or participants were viewing the photos um, of landscapes and based on that we as we we have some conclusions about their health so these results should be interpreted with caution because the laboratory exposure is as it seems very different from our real exposure and what we feel and see in the park so these are the main findings main um, results of this study that was conducted in singapore the study was um funded by ministry of national development and we are actually still in the process of publication of the last results and we'll be also publishing a technical report uh, with nparks uh, which will highlight the strategies 
um, for um, urban uh, green space design based on these findings. Uh, so let's get to the contemplative landscape model and the features and different and nitty gritty of all this. Uh, and to start with, I actually, I wanted to show one of the outcomes of the analysis that shows that not all of these features are contributing equally to the final score. Some of the features appear to be more important than others. And it is, um, we shouldn't neglect any, any of the seven features. But if there is really no way to incorporate all seven uh, of these features, we can use this uh, chart to prioritize. So we can see that the most important are landscape layers and character of peace and silence and archetypal elements. Other ones, other um, components are not too much less important. Uh, but uh, they just have different, let's say, different way of contributing, I would say. And if there is a necessity to prioritize, we should prioritize the designs with, um, of course, the most contributing features. Okay, so let's go to one by one, starting from landscape players. What are landscape players? Uh, so landscape players, um category is all about the depth of the view how far we can see how deep and how how far our eyes can reach so apparently there is something um like the comfort of long distance views where our eyes are resting and so our mind resting when we can look afar. Um, on this photo, we can see uh, things that are very close to us, so in the foreground, but we can also see things that are very, very far. They're already misty, a bit more blue-ish because of the aerial perspective. They start blurring out. So this gives us some this, this physical distance from the objects give us at the same time the psychological distance uh, to things, to problems, to issues, to our daily stress and uh, so on. So it actually gives us the being away um, feeling, sense of being away which is very much emphasized by the attention restoration theory, for example. And the other theory, the prospect refuge theory, is also talking about the far distance views being very important for our feeling of security and comfort. Because when we see far, evolutionary, we can also see from where the predators is approaching, right? Uh, it's connected to also savanna, savanna preference theory. So there's a lot, a lot of research behind the landscape layers and why we should prioritize looking afar. And uh, in fact, in the city, in highly um, built up environment, uh, we don't have that many possibilities to look afar. Uh, sometimes the only far away view will be looking up to the sky. That's why sky oriented design is also very important for contemplation. So anyway, uh, the landscape layers um, uh, category is based on that notion. We should be able to see the three distance zone, foreground, middle ground and background and our eyes and our brain will then feel the sort of comfort of being in that space. Uh, spaces that have these three uh, zones, three distance zones visible and explicit to our eye, 
will score five or six points in the landscape uh, layers uh, scale. Uh, wherever the land layers are there, but they are not really enhancing the visual quality that much, or they are like kind of canopied, kind of covered, we will, score, we will give them three to four points. When they are not visible at all, or they don't, just completely don't enhance or something maybe very disturbing <laughs> in those in this distance, uh, then we will give them one or two points. Um, according to the study, so there were two studies with uh, different uh, groups of experts uh, conducted across the years. Um, and according to one st study, uh, the highest score for landscape layers was de detected by experts in this photo from Italy. Uh, and scored 5.85 points across the experts in this particular scale. And in the other study, 5.46 points. Uh, that's the photo from Czech Republic. Sorry, from Slovakia. Slovakia. <laughs> uh, next category, landform. Landform is all about the ground the shape of the ground, which is, in other words, topography. The topography should be a natural topography. Everything that is uh, not a natural topography, for example, what we tend to do in the cities is flattening out for just ease of construction, um, flattening out all the mounds, all the undulating landform. Uh, uh, that, but that is not good for the com contemplative landscape, of course. So um, the nature created the topography in more organic way. So we are um, usually, th th there is not many natural landscapes with completely flat ground. There would be always some sort of uh, natural lines, um, mounds, uh, valleys, hills, and so on. Um, then there are also very rugged landforms, very rock, uh, rocky, uh, harsh landscapes, which are also not so welcoming because of just the sharpness of, uh, of the stone. So uh, actually the most um, uh, pleasant, let's say, the most uh, accessible and the most contemplative, those that induce the most contemplative experience would be the, the natural topography undulating uh, landforms that are also diversified. They are leading our eyes to certain views. Uh, they through the skylines and uh, skyline and how the horizon line is shaping, they can um, stimulate us to look up towards the sky or to go to some hill. Uh, then in that category, there is also a lot of what we can see on the ground, what lines we can see on the ground. Are they straight lines or rather, um, biomorphic asymmetrical lines, um, everything that is more asymmetrical and biomorphic will be more contemplative and therefore also connected to biophilia hypothesis, a preference and um, natural inclination to life-like forms. Uh, so uh, these types of landforms uh, that I mentioned will be scoring five or six points. Mm, when the landform is not so significant or it's hard to say, hard to really judge, we will score three or four points. Uh, and then if uh, the landform is flat or uh, very rugged, uh, rough, rough uh, we will score one or two points. In those studies, you can see two examples um, of highest scores for landform. First one, uh, we can see that 
not only there is the, the, the green spaces on the kind of mound slope, but also the terrace is accentuated with the curvy line and the path is also not straight line, but actually kind of curved line. The second, uh, second study sh uh, sh highlighted this photo as the most scoring for landform. And this is because of the, the change in the uh, elevated uh, uh, path uh, going through the top of the hill uh, that is also bringing our eyes upwards. Uh, the biodiversity. Um, in the biodiversity, what is uh, very important is the connection with actual living forms, plants and animals. So richness in the plants and animal species, seasonal, diurnal changes of the vegetation forms and a balanced degree of wilderness will play a big role here. Um, we want the nature, the like representatives of nature and the kingdom of animals, kingdom of plants, we want them to be as if they are in the wild, so it shouldn't be too much tendon and manicured. Um, when the biodiversity seem really like that, like wild, untamed, self-sown, uh, spontaneous, we would attribute five or six points, highest uh, scores to this uh, kind of scenes and environments. If it's um, on moderate level, three or four points. If it's on the low level uh, or we have no sense of any changes, any motion in that uh, space, like um, there is not much diversity or maybe monoculture of just one or two plants, uh, for example, a uh, grass lawn. <laughs> then we would not have a uh, high scoring. Also here, the biophobic phenomena, there, there is a list of biophobic phenomena such as uh, snakes, spiders, uh, bad smells, uh, some very loud noises, uh, blood, darkness. There, there is a range of them that when they appear in the scene, of, obviously we will not want to. Uh, we will not score them high. Mm -hmm. So the highest score from the biodiversity from previous studies were those two landscapes. So here we can see the woods um, and we can see the park view that has a duck and according to experts it has the highest sense of biodiversity, of connectivity, of potential connect, connection to nature. Uh, next uh, category is the color and light. So in this color, it's all about not um, over exposing the, peak, the design with contrasting vivid colors. Uh, it's all about the visibility of sun and shade uh, playing with the light so that we can see the light phenomena, uh, we can see the reflection um, and uh, shadows moving on the ground, casted through the canopies of trees. Um, the color should be harmonious, natural, broken, uh, muted, and uh, the, the movement of the daily passage of the sun should be visible. And there is a lot of uh, things that create this color and light situations, scenery uh, that uh, designers can play with and incorporate in their designs. Here on the photo, you can see the uh, reflective uh, reflection garden from uh, Seattle. Um, where designer uh, intentionally designed the experience of the color green. So there is no other color in the, in the space rather than green. Um, okay, we have to move forward. Uh, these are two photo scorings 
the, the highest according to different panels of experts for the same category color and light. Compatibility. This is something um, that all designers should be familiar with. How to create harmonious design, how to not mess up the space with uh, disturbing elements or how to create a spatial order. Um, it's all about working out the scales of objects so that they're adjacent to each other. Um, how to open and close the views how to balance between objects, but also between what is natural and what is tamed, built up by human. Um, here, it, it is very important not to be too wild, of course, um, because we don't want our green spaces to be too wild, so that could feel insecure. Um, and uh, research is showing that too. And also the compatibility, uh, the, the design compatibility uh, requires, for the contemplative score, requires the inward orientation of space, which uh, will also bring about the inward psychological focus so that we can focus on our inner self and the design of the Surrounding induces that. Highest scores for compatibility were found in, again, the similar pictures that we already have seen. The archetypal, archetypal elements, another uh, very important um, category. There are these things in landscapes, these elements that are standing out to us, to our unconscious perception, if you, uh, if you will, um, called also in psychology, in uh, psychoanalysis, collective unconscious. This is a term um, invented by uh, Carl Gustav Jung. And so according to Jung, there are just certain um, elements, when we see them, immediately we will, it will evoke a certain um, subconscious response, emotional response in us. And some of these elements are derived from nature. And these are water, everything with water, because water is really important to our uh, selves, to our uh, species, <laughs> to all the species, in fact. Then the path and clearing, path through the woods, leading to a clearing, for example. So all those uh, things, path, clearing and forest are important, but when they are combined together into one narrative, they are even more powerful. Uh, mountain and hilltop, old tree, uh, stone, and actually many more, but this list is not uh, complete. There may be more, these are just the ones that uh, I, uh, I included in my previous studies and uh, used to work with, but there may be more. Um, Young also never completed the, the list of archetypes and symbolic elements. So if we have the landscape, uh, uh, urban space, with those explicitly, uh, with explicit presence of these elements, these uh, landscapes will score high in this category. Uh, if there are no such elements or they are like faded, like completely invisible to, to the viewer, to the visitor, then of course we will give them lower score. Uh, here we can see some examples of uh, water. Um, water pond, water mirror is very important in the psychoanalysis because it reflects the soul, it reflects the sky, um, and other reasons too. I don't want to get in too much into detail. And we can see the big archetypal tree, solitary tree, that is connected to um, symbol of tree of life, um, tree of enlightenment, maturity, and a lot of different things, actually. Um, 
So yeah, we have to go further. The character of peace and silence. Last but not least, it's one of the most important um, categories. And the character of peace and silence is extremely important for urban green spaces. These spaces are inviting for rest and relaxation. They give a sense of respite and solitude, actually being far from the crowds is important. Um, and contrasting with the urban uh, chaos, urban noise. It provides the tr tranquility and serenity and buffers the noise with different uh, features, with different like um, solutions. Uh, it, it's a recommend actually, the recent research recommended not to be dense in technology and infrastructure, electricity and interest infrastructure. It also shouldn't um, it shouldn't stimulate to use our own technology uh, to be relaxing and uh, contemplative. Um, and it should be comfortable. Uh, here there is a poster by uh, the artist Banksy with his a sarcastic commentary about how benches sometimes are the anti-sitting benches, preventing people from actually sitting too long because they would be made of metal, too hot in the summer, too cold in the winter, uh, or they would be slopey or slippery, or they would have uncomfortable uh, armrests, or they would prevent people from lounging or laying down. Uh, so this yeah, this is a kind of commentary about the comfort and relaxation that can be provided by the space. Uh, and it's all up to designers to implement these solutions. So uh, in our previous studies, the character of peace and silence scores were highest in this space on the left. It's in the Washington DC uh, Cathedral uh, Garden. And again, the same photo with a duck. This is actually from Portugal. Um, these tools uh, created the highest character of peace and silence sense uh, of all pictures that were in the set of this study. What are the implications for urban design? Uh, so basically, oh, here you can see the cover of the the upcoming uh, N Parks publication uh, technical report, where some of the findings, some findings, and some of the contemplative landscape uh, features will be uh, covered. And basically, what is this trying to say, and uh, what are the main implications from my studies and my presentation today? is that the urban green spaces quality is a very important aspect in achieving the goals for mental health and well-being in cities. And exposure to landscapes, the scenes that are particularly um, designed uh, in this, uh, and um, uh, called contemplative landscapes with high contemplative scores uh, are actually quite easy to to work as the medium for improvement of mental health because if you have that design which is in some way intuitive to lots of uh, designers and landscape architects, it was intuitive to Olmsted for example, um, then it's just about being exposed to this landscape. You don't have to do anything, you just go and be passively exposed to the spaces. Uh, they will trigger certain response in, in the visitor. Um, contemplative landscape model is further. The, uh, the one tool that is right now around that is validated against health outcomes and serves uh, specifically for urban green space design. Um, and landscape architects are by far from um, my observations the professionals that are the best equipped with their training to use, be able to use the contemplative landscapes model uh, to design the contemplative landscapes in cities because they are familiar with the 
uh, ecological values. They are uh, experts in plants, planting plants, the material of their um, designs. So uh, landscape architects would be the, the profession that is best equipped, but also urban planners, architects will know how to do that as well. Um, for the most part, what's important is just um, awareness and uh, putting and acknowledging that there is this problem and there are solutions to, to solve it with design. Um, as a last image, I wanted to show you the interesting image that is showing a future city. Uh, this image was generated by artificial intelligence, so-called open AI. A tool um, according to the phrase uh, a person looking at the future city full of scenic uh, natural views. Um, so artificial intelligence has a quite similar I would say similar views to my views <laughs> over how the future cities might look like if they will be mentally healthy, more mentally healthy, more full of nature, although I would have to see what is on the ground. Uh, so with that, uh, I am leaving you for today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm open to any questions in the Q&A sessions. I'm also writing a book which will be much more uh, detailed in terms of explaining the, all of the contemplative landscape features and giving a proper literature scientific background to all the features that I mentioned today. Um, so you can also contact me on my email if you have any further questions. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I hope to get a lot of questions from you. Thank you. <laughs>